So, um, good, uh, whatever, midday, <laughs> afternoon. Uh, during the next 30 minutes, I would like to talk about some aspects of teaching music to children and young people. Well, this is very loud. Can you turn it? No, okay. okay. Uh, I have been teaching music to, to children and, and young people for more than 25 years, and still I keep uh, having problems, difficulties to solve and to invent new things all the time. But as we have only half an hour, I just try to introduce some ideas that, that you can maybe yourself develop further. Uh, the first thing I would like to talk some words about is warming up. It is a very necessary procedure. Everybody knows, every small child knows that you come to the choir rehearsal and you warm up. But sometimes it becomes sort of mechanical because they already know that there is one exercise and there is another exercise. So how can we use warming up to enliven somehow, to put some life and energy into the choir rehearsal? Uh, the first thing is that Warming up is not just technical things. It is, we greet our singers. Usually when I work with my boys' choir or, or with my girls' choir, I get them after school. So they are tired. They come maybe from different classes, from different schools. And the first thing I have to sort of greet them and, and so that they would feel weighted and, and welcome. And so we have to create an atmosphere. We have to... Uh, help them to concentrate on singing. And uh, this is something that we can do during the warm warming up. Uh, the first thing that we need to get rid of are the very big tensions in the neck. The more, mm, uh, how to say, the better pupils they are, the more they have the tension in the neck and the better singers they want to be, again, the tension is here. I know it from my own <laughs> experience. So, I would suggest to move as much as possible and to uh, emphasize the stress of movement not in the, uh, in the area what is really uh, the, the danger area, but somewhere else. So for instance, uh, maybe some of you have, have uh, uh, made that, but let's try together. Stand up please, everybody. <laughs> and uh, the, the thing that works, even with uh, older, I don't know, boys, young men, is that you imagine that you have a tail here and you can do whatever with the tail. You can write your own name. You can write the name of your friend, of your neighbor. Let's just, as we have a very short time, let's do it. We will write the first letter of our name. And so we are, our mind is engaged in the letter, in the hip area, and our neck and chin will be completely free. So just, just start to do it and feel how the tension is here, and you, your mind is, should be that you're not just moving, you're writing your name. You're writing the letter, the first letter of you. So, <laughs> feels funny, but it's, it's the tension goes away from here. So we can have an imaginary hula circle, circle. So let's hula down and hula up. And again, we just don't, we don't move just so, but we make concrete circles up and down. So then uh, let's put some, let's add, some sounds to this movement and never lose movement while opening up. Uh, we have to use our fantasy as much as possible. Let's imagine, well, today it is windy. Well, what can I do out of this wind? We can have this... I, I'm, I'm an alto, let's do it higher. Let's start here. Feel that your muscles are doing. And now we have the movement. Okay, we, the wind moves for instance like that. Let's try. Very good, and so on. Then it is raining a bit. What can you do with that? We have, for instance, well, in English, in Estonian and in Hungarian, in whatever language, you have different words. For instance, drop, drop, drop. Let's try. And some movement with the hand. Let's try and feel what is doing it here. Yeah. Drop, drop, drop. And, and from different uh, heights, again, you can play a lot with it. Let's imagine, well, it started to rain a bit more. You have this exercise. It's very light. You have the light, the tongue is free. But again, um, some movement which is controversial to the, the melody goes up. Your movement should go down, not to stress. 
When, when it goes all up, then you have a chest here. So let's think, for instance, the rain goes down. Let's try. And so on. You can go higher and, and more down. Then, for instance, the sun is shining. Or you want the choir is having some very difficult, I don't know, concert. And you want them to make, um, feel free. You can, of course, the exercises are not in a, in a logical sequence now. You have to start from, from small exercise and go up. But for instance, today is a beautiful day. You get the emotion of a beautiful day. And you can get the moment of opening up the rib cage. Let's try. Today is a beautiful day. And you go up with that, you can go with down with that. With that. So, uh, even um, uh, small children, they very often come to tell you what has happened at home. Somebody has got a cat. Okay, this Mary got a cat. Let's do something with it. Meow, meow. You can play with a nasal. You get immediately this kind of movement here. Let's try. Meow. Mm -hmm. And you get a very nice grrr sound because the cat like, and you have this movement, what the cat does. Grrr. You have this lovely feeling, you have the chin is soft, you play and you get the result that you want. Let's try. Grrr. And you smile, of course, because you love your cat very much. Grrr. Yes, and the touching these places, which can be critical, help them to relax. And so on and so on. Uh, one uh, very good advice which I have noticed our, our vocal uh, teacher, our vocal coach does. When you want to, them to remember something, for instance, you want them to have your chin free, then you sing the same command. For instance, let's try, let's sing this sentence. My chin is very stiff. Feel what your chin feels like. My chin is very stiff. And now let's try to sing. My chin is completely free. My chin is completely free. And when you sing this kind of command, your chin becomes, you, you feel, it is rather different if you sing that your chin is stiff or you sing that your chin is free. And the same thing, well, our vocal coach uses very often. When she wants them to open your mouth, she sings. I'm singing with my mouth open. Whatever you want, the command, you sing it through and it's sort of, you memorize this command. Then, if you have smaller groups, uh, and this works even with, uh, with older children, try to make, sometimes, if you have more time, make it a game. The, the vowels, the letters, the consonants, are, uh, it is immense playground. For instance, let's imagine uh, the sound m. Mm. What different moods or what different things with your mouth you can do. We, our aim is to teach them to move the muscles inside their mouth, just to be able to, to sing different, uh, different pitches, different timbres. So, uh, for instance, uh, with letter M, we can be surprised. Let's try to do it. Mm, mm, mm. See what happens in our mouth. Now we deny. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay. Now we can be sort of disappointed. Mm. Again, different. And now we can, for instance, I don't know, we can depict a cow. Mm. Let's try. Mm. You can write some letters on the blackboard. You can divide them so that you can play with the, with the different sounds. For instance, if you have a sound, shh, what comes to your mind? Train and immediately rhythmical exercises. So you can get whatever you want and you, uh, one important thing is you make the singers sort of improvise with those letters. You can give them cards if you have a smaller group. Your card is M, your card is A, your card is <laughs> whatever you can do. You can have them play some situations in duets so that you, they have like a dialogue. Or with one has one letter, the other has another, and they depict a situation. So we don't have uh, enough time to play that through. But, but I have seen that work. And, and this kind of thing, when they have to improvise themselves, uh, makes them feel more confident. We have a dance singer who, who spends half of the time of the lesson just in, uh, encouraging the children to improvise. And it gives very good results, uh, even in singing, because the child sort of feels more free to express 
themselves. And you need to express yourself in singing because it sort of takes a lot of courage to sing, for instance, forte or to, to not to be too shy. So I think this, thank you very much. And, and um, uh, this is uh, really very important if ever we have time. And now uh, that you sat down is also very significant because um, the last topic about the warming up which I wanted to touch is that uh, please try sometimes warming up while sitting because actually our work is done all by sitting. We warm up standing, even when they go to vocal coach the five minutes, they are standing. They are paying attention how they are standing and then they come back to the choir lesson and they sit and, and all, all is lost. So sometimes it is very useful to open up while singing and just to pay attention what is the posture like sitting because during opening up you can pay more attention to the physical part. Uh, our children are used to sit very badly at the lessons and then they come they just start singing in this position but they lose their voice well in, very quickly if they really use their body not in a correct way. Okay, uh, now let's move on uh, to Kodai method and Gregorian chant. Uh, for more than 20 years I have uh, been conducting St. Michael's Boys Choir and our focus lies in historical music, in church music, and we sing a lot of Gregorian chant. Uh, there are some uh, singers among the boys who have quite moderate, let's say, singing abilities. And I started to notice that whenever we sang more Gregorian chant in autumn when the new singers arrived, they sort of started to sing much better, more quickly. So it is really homophonic music, especially Gregorian chant, is a perfect recipe for uh, helping a moderate singer achieve good intonation. Uh, we sing in St. Michael's choir Gregorian chant from quadrat notation and at first I thought it would be difficult for the boys. We have, um, I have the boys from the age of 10 until 18. But then suddenly I realized that in our school where solfege is, is being taught by Kodai method that it is absolutely easy for them to study Gregorian chant because the root is the same. The, the notes, the relative pitch and, and everything is the same. You probably all know this hymn with Quaint Laxis and I just, uh, you can sing together with me if you know it, just to remind, look, pay attention to the first notes. This is authentic Gregorian chant and this is what they really can do. Uh, I take a pitch which is comfortable for me. Excuse me if it's too low. Ut que ant laxis resonare fibris mira gestorum famulitorum solve polluti labire atur sancte Ioannes. So this, instead of this sancte Ioannes, they didn't have this note and it was added later. At first it was C, but then it was turned into T to have the different beginnings of the, of the different letters in the beginning of the names. So with, this, these, with these two systems combined together, uh, it, is, it is really very easy to teach Gregorian chant to children. And now let's have a look at this, oh, where is my, excuse me, it's my first time with this thing, I hope that Okay, it's not seen. Uh, if you see this kind of a picture, it can be rather sort of complicated to you. But uh, actually, for the children at the age of 10 to 15 to 16, it is very easy. So this uh, is the version of Gregorian chant that I'd like to work with. It's called triplex version. And because up here, above the quadrat notation, there are neumes from Laon Monastery and down the red ones are from uh, uh, St. Galen Monastery. So they are both around the 10th century. And the quadrat notation which gives us the pitch is here. There are four uh, staves. So it is very easy. Now you see the, F, the key here is F key. If we didn't have this first black thing here, then it was, uh, would be a shape of C and it would be a Do key, but now it is Fa key. So actually it is very easy, if F is here, you can find that Do is above the first tape. So it is very, 
actually very easy to think. Uh, uh, let's try to sing this through. Let's not pay attention to the neumes just now. Let's try to sing it through with notes. Uh, so we start from note re, then come fa. Let's try. Mm, re, re, fa, sol, fa, 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 re, re, fa, fa, re, fa, fa, do, mi, re, re, mi, re, re, do, re, fa, mi, fa, sol, re, mi, re, do, do, and so on. See, it's very easy. Uh, this melody is very easy and this could be re uh, also remembered just from hearing. But if we have complex alleluias where the melismas Alleluia So the, the children just start sliding around. But whenever you uh, sing it, this kind of music through with the notes they immediately understand where the notes are and, and they understand how the melody line goes. But I chose an easier one so that <laughs> because we don't have much time. Now, uh, but when we see the quadrat notation, it, we get this feeling that this melody is just stepping because this quadrat, they are like building stones and, and we don't get this, uh, this kind of uh, musical feeling. But Gregorian chant gives much more than just the pitch. It gives a perfect phrasing. It gives a perfect sensing of words and, and of legato. And this is why we need the neumes. Uh, see, let's um, uh, imagine how the neumes were invented. In the monasteries, uh, the monks or the, those who were responsible had a task to write down the music. And they were starting to depict graphically what they heard. So when they heard that the music was going very smoothly, they did, they wrote it down very smoothly. Here, for instance, two notes. Oh, they are connected, they are tied together. You can't sing it. Oh, 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 but you have to have legato when you see it here. Or this pes. Oh, or oh. It shows that it has to be connected. For instance, torculos is three notes. Oh. And this kind of graphic line inspires the child because the, the signs are very easy. And it is very easy to, to uh, explain to the children that you have to tie it. See, it is written like that. It is graphically connected. When the note has to be uh, more light, it is depicted with a punctum, with a dot, or with a comma. Let's, uh, uh, for instance, here. We see that the first notes have to start going already. Then, uh, for instance, these three commas, they are always used when the notes are on the same pitch. Ba, ba, ba. But we see that the th it always moves towards the third. It can be seen here up with the laon, because they always show the third is longer. But with the uh, with, uh, St. Gallen neumes, sometimes they show the third comma longer, sometimes not. It was already known that da, 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 da. you have to keep the phrasing going. So whenever you start to work with the neumes, again, I don't have enough time to, to explain everything, but it helps you to understand that this music has to fly. The quadrat notation just gives you pitch. You already know that, and now you get the phrasing. Let's uh, try to do the second line, because here are some very good neumes. Uh, we uh, sang it. But let's now try to sing the w it with the words. See, the first three notes are very much tied. And you get immediately the word. Let's try to sing filius together. Filius. Very good. Now, these neumes show that they have to be slower. You have this kind of epizema above this me. And when you go, go up here, it doesn't mean that it has to be sort of interrupted, but it's just that the writer thought how to write it that the notes are longer when I went. Pa. Okay, when I stop here, pa, it takes more time. So it just means that you have a longer, longer uh, note combination. Meus, filius, meus. Let's sing. Filius, meus. 
Mm -hmm. And now again. Again, a very well connected note. And there's two punctums are very light. Let's try. And now let's do the whole line. And now we understand that it's really, it has to fly in spite of the quadrat notation. Let's do, do this from Filius. Filius meus estu. So you get the phrasing in words, in phrases, and you can use it anywhere in any other music. So you are free of the bar lines. You, are, you can add this kind of phrasing in any metrical music that comes afterwards. And it gives you a good basis of this kind of flying music. Uh, I'm sorry we could not work with the whole piece. I would love to because I hear that you get uh, the meaning what I, what I mean immediately. But it's again uh, a, a longer topic and, and I, I have tried it for 20 years and I know that for the children it is very, even it is interesting for them for instance. Sometimes we don't have this kind of triplex version, we have only quadrat notation and I think, okay, what kind of news could there be? And the smaller boys, they really enjoy to come to the blackboard and try, well, I think this, this is this new that is, it's another pl playful world for them. But for grown-ups, it's what news, what is this? So just don't be afraid. Okay, then connection between vocal and instrumental studies. Again, I think the biggest asset that uh, the singing in a choir gives to a person who studies an instrument is the feeling of legato and phrasing. Uh, sometimes even instrument teachers, they like their pupils to sing the melodies through that they get a feeling of this legato and, and musical floating. And I know that from my own practical experience because both of my own children are instrumentalists. And suddenly, although my son did not sing at all, but suddenly I started to hear that when he was playing the piano, he by himself started to sing through the phrases. So actually, he had understood that this singing thing is helping. Uh, but those who sing in choirs, for them it is much easier because they are used to sing. They, they are, it is something natural for them. In this uh, Old Town Music School in Tallinn where I work, uh, in our music school, choir singing is compulsory for everybody. Even if, if your speciality is an instrument, you still have to sing in a choir. And that is our sort of heads of the school have understood that this kind of thing is, is necessary also for instrument players. Of course, there is always a question of time. We don't have pride, we want to play football, we want to go dancing, and, but this is a dilemma, of course. Uh, and on the other hand, those who study instrument, uh, this uh, study helps them to be more precise in notes. They, are, they can read the music better because they work in different, uh, different dimensions with the music. So it's both sides very useful. Uh, in our school, it is possible to study early music instruments as well. As, and as we in the boys' choir do a lot of early music and a lot of church music, I can use the skills of those who really study some, some early music instruments. And I have tried to make use of the instruments studying boys as much as possible. I have to make the arrangements myself all the time because the boys, they unfortunately grow up and they leave school and then new ones come and they study new instruments. Uh, but it has to be according to the abilities of the child. So it has to support the instrument studies. You, can't, you can never give them a task that is too difficult for them because it has to be a place where they can show that they are studying an instrument and now I can use it. Now I can sort of help the choir and be very useful there. So it, you, you always, I even have made uh, some parts for, for the same instrument more difficult and easy according to who the boy is who can play it and, and so that it would be something that he can really do and it would be a positive, inspiring effect. Uh, I wanted to show you um, one piece uh, to show you how simple the part or instrument can be, which can enliven the music so that you don't need to be a composer to, to be able to simply give the singers possibilities to play and give the choir possibility to sort of hear that, oh, now uh, there are new uh, colors some instruments. It is not just the piano which you have every day in the classroom, but there is something else. So, uh, we are going to see a song. Okay, 
Uh, now I really ask everybody to move closer because um, otherwise I would really like you to sing it through. Just get even the chairs and, and come closer and I will move here. They might do that. Yeah. Now, can you see? Here is a, this is a, a sacred hymn. It's a kind of a folk variation from church hymns, and this is one of my favorite genres because uh, these uh, pieces are um, mostly found in museums in Estonia. They were not allowed to be sung during the Soviet time, and, and the Estonian people almost forgot that they they had this kind of music as people sang church hymns together at home and they simply put some variations, they, they uh, forgot sometimes the melodies and, and they invented new melody lines. But this is a completely, uh, a comparatively not too melismatic thing that you can sing with a choir. And I, I have put the German text under it so you know the origin of the of a text because the Estonian hymns were always translated from German hymns. So uh, we can sing it through with just using bar bar, we don't have time for the words. And usually there were fermatas always uh, in the end of each line, but I have written it uh, with really concrete notes so that we can follow the, the rhythm. Let's try. <laughs> This is actually the song that I have from the museum. I have the six or seven verses, and now I want to sing it with a choir. This is a, well, you see, very, very uh, easy part. This should be uh, played with, a, uh, with a plucking instruments. Uh, I used, for instance, kantele, it's a kind of sitar that we have in Estonia. It's a rather big, w w they have them in Finland as well, so that it can support the whole choir. And this is the part that anybody can play, even myself on this instrument. Uh, but it can be a lute, it can be a cello, it can be whatever instrument. And even the, the octave pitch is not so important. Uh, actually, could we do so that, that men imitate this kind of plucking sound? Bim, 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 bim. And the whole idea is that you can imagine the measures are mixed and that is what gives really the effect that something is going on and you don't understand exactly what is going on because something and it is changing because the verses every verse starts on a different place on this this so let's try the, the men starting bim, 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 bim. and the ladies ba, 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 ba. Very nice, very nice. And and uh, again, this instrument is bum, bum, bum. should have this kind of logic that you stress the first, and it's like this floating is, is with different rhythms. Now, what else can we do? We can add a bass and any instrument. We have Rebecca you can have a cello, you can have a bass flute, whatever you have at your disposal. And you can have a second voice. Here in, uh, I only played this, uh, this voice because I had a fiddle. You can play it. Uh, I would really like, this should sound if we sing an octave lower because uh, uh, with the recorders, the, the notation is a bit different. Uh, Again, um, let's say that those men who are basses could sing the bass part. Those women who are altos should start here. 
And the rest, please sing what you used to sing. And let's try to make this floating again so that the first one is twist and try to have this kind of phrasing all the time. And let's feel. If it's sort of like on the, the a bit floating C should be the feeling. Okay, the men start and then ladies. kind of kind of this um, sort of medieval a bit empty feeling so um, thank you it was nice and let's uh, hear a little bit how the boys choir did it with instruments so you get this uh, this feeling <coughs> as soon as Kaya can <laughs> Kaya has a very difficult uh, task to to be uh, sort of in control <laughs> with all this uh, non-familiar technique thank you very much. So now the octave is added just. So this is the plucker. These are the flutes and this is the bass system and the rebecca. topics which I would like to touch briefly. One is uh, going to a concert. Uh, I have struggled for the last five years or a bit more. Uh, I discovered that it is not enough just to make music yourself because we have to give our singers a kind of more deep insight into music. Uh, one thing is to listen to fellow pupils which they do when they study instruments but the other thing is that you want, you have to listen to great masters. You have to listen at least some experience. Experience where? What is the aim? Where should we go? Some of the parents say that uh, we have um, CDs at home. Why do we need to go to a concert? But again, this kind of live feeling, the atmosphere of the concert, how you go, you you get prepared. You, this is a kind of event. Maybe you see a, a very famous uh, instrumentalist. You, you remember it. I don't know for you, you tell your children that this is a very famous player, I, I heard him, or this is a very famous choir. And you can go together, you can share your opinions. And I started to see that um, some of them, when you told that we are going to the concert, they are, they are sleeping there. So I started to give them tasks to write something to me. It doesn't need to be uh, long, it can be just a couple of sentences but it has to be your own ideas. Now, it is just something that I wrote down just to show something that I would like them to talk about Well, when I explain. Just something, for instance. What, and, and the more you teach them in the choir, the more you can see that, listen to those things what we study in the choir. So, uh, now I have uh, such a system that uh, 
they have to give me written feedback twice a year. In the school where we get, get marks, it is much easier, of course, to organize it. In the radio choir where we don't get marks, they still keep asking, why do we have to do that? But the thing was, I got to know that the parents even don't know what it is like to go to the concert. So I started to educate the parents. Every autumn when the school year starts, we have the gathering of parents when we explain what our work is like. And then I explain to the parents why it is necessary to go to the concert. And I have gotten, uh, got uh, written feedback from the parents. Oh, how interesting it was. Oh, really, it is so useful. And they sometimes go together with the families and, and uh, I have got even some parents to like to go to the concerts. And um, my uh, most uh, uh, joyful feedback was when some of the boys who had graduated from the secondary school who were already studying somewhere abroad started to write to me that we are so used to giving you written feedback. We went to a wonderful concert, somebody who is studying to be a doctor in Oxford, <laughs> a law <laughs> doctor, and started to write to me about the concerts that he, he visited or, well, some other experience. So I, I, ha I have seen that they have got used to going to concerts and they have used to sort of getting the richness out of the concert, not just going because you were told, but this is the aim what you, which you want to get. Um, most of our choir singers will never be professional musicians, but they get the richness of the music and that is what our aim really is. Uh, and then the last topic is um, uh, if we, now I just told that, that it is not enough to listen to technical music because the sound really is not the same, but there are some points where we still can make use of the technology. Uh, about this scene, this is our Estonian song celebration. It is about 30,000 singers coming together every five years and even between that uh, uh, song celebration for youth. Uh, about 60% of the singers are from uh, youth or children's choirs. At school they have usually one choir lesson per week and they have one conductor. If you have a school choir, a mixed choir, you have four voices. If you have a three-part girls' choir, you have three voices. Where is the time? And the repertory is very demanding. You have to pass a kind of um, jury if you get to the song festival or not, because more uh, people study, but as you see, the, the stage has limits. So uh, they have to sing very well to the uh, jury, or how to call it, uh, to be able to pass to the song festival. And now the teachers are really in trouble. They, they have to acquire the material and they don't know how. Uh, some of the teachers years ago started to say that they themselves sing the parts differently, uh, just record themselves and uh, send it to the singers so that they can study. And now even officially the, the committee who organizes the song festivals has started to put more difficult pieces that with uh, orchestra and some individual parts so that the singers can learn at home. Uh, I don't know how many singers use it, but it's a possibility for those teachers who simply cannot afford or don't have enough time. And uh, just I wanted uh, to end with, a, with one example so that you understand that it's not an easy task. Ingrid here knows it very well because <laughs> she is the conductor of the, the same piece, uh, of the same choir. Uh, at the song festival. Uh, I'm showing you the note and uh, let's uh, listen to the beginning of the song and then I can show you an example how you can learn from the, from the internet really. This piece was commissioned.
It means busy and in a hurry all the time. And now it is going to repeat. So this song is going to be performed with 8,000 children on this big stage. And all the teachers may be in some smaller villages who are not so very sort of convenient with different rhythms and different this kind of a bit of blues, rock feeling. And they are really in difficulties. So uh, I'm trying to show you a small, um, a small piece where you understand what is the material like which can be found on the website of the song festival so that all the children can just, it's their home task, you now learn it. And the choir conductor puts it together. This is the third voice. There is of course one danger always when we uh, tell the children to study something which is really technical, that they get to used to the same tempo, the same rhythm and they lose interest. They don't look at the conductor anymore. But this is a very great big danger, especially on the song festival ground because the conductor is really like a tiny ant there. And so uh, that is why the conductor has to be very clever. He has to, when the child studies from this kind of material, you have to trick it during the rehearsal. You have to try different pauses, different tempos, so that the, the singer still is alert. Otherwise, they just, uh, they are used to that. The beat is always the same. I know what it's like. Even sometimes when it's uh, the piano accompaniment, the pianist maybe slows down here or there. The children already know it, and they don't look at the conductor at all. So it has to be, the conductor has to know it very well. So uh, I'm sorry I have taken up <laughs> more time than I, than I had to. Uh, to end my presentation, uh, I just uh, think that we conductors have a very difficult task from one side. We have to teach the children as much as possible and so that they would be, they sing well and they stand well and they would be clever and we have to demand from them. And the other thing is we have to keep them happy. We have to keep them inspired and to love music after our rehearsal and after they go away from our choir. So this is what demands a great deal of fantasy and invention and, and energy. And, and uh, sometimes when the conductors get tired, well, it's something that I wish to you that, that you would find this kind of inspiration and energy even, even when you are tired. <laughs> because it sort of keeps... <laughs> So, good luck. <laughs>